Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class we're going to be doing a new author today a new short story uh, this is going to be slightly different from what you've been doing today but before I launch into the story uh, let me quickly go back over what we have done so far we started this module with a travelogue by Charles Dickens and then we went on to the introduction of the short story um, different uh, short story writers and we've had um, stories written by Edgar Allan Poe, we've had um, stories by Mark Twain um, and uh, what we're going to be discussing today is uh, a story by H.G. Wells. Um, some of you may have heard the name. H.G. Um, Wells is a pioneer in many ways. Um, you know that um, in the United States there was a lot of work that was done um, in short story writing in the 19th and 20th centuries and in fact even now it is a very popular form of literature. The best thing about a short story is that it's a narrative that is complete in itself and it can be read in one sitting. You don't have to spend days or weeks um, trying to complete the narrative. It is uh, sometimes one incident, sometimes it is a series of events that takes place. Sometimes the focus of the short story writer is only on one particular character and what he or she goes through. So um, different forms of the short story emerged um, in the short uh, history that short story has had. I know that's too many shorts in one sentence, but um, you, you get my meaning because the short story did not take uh, centuries to evolve. It almost evolved overnight um, in England with Sir Walter Scott and you know that um, as far as short story writing was concerned once it had emerged as a genre not much work was done in England on uh, short story writing and once it had emerged um, it traveled to the continent across um, the English Channel to the continent and you had um, French short story writers emerging. You had uh, a lot of work done uh, in Russia by Turgenev and Anton Chekhov and we've had a few short stories that we've been discussing by Chekhov also. Um, then the other place where a lot of the work was being done was in the United States and um, we've had a few um, short story writers discussed. We had writers like Edgar Allan Poe and um, we had um, short stories by Mark Twain whose actual name you know was Samuel Clemens. So H.G. Wells is one of those Americans who took to short story writing and um, who was very successful at it. You know this was the time when short stories were being published in newspapers um, and magazines and it was um, a way of um, of getting an income, of earning a little extra money because uh, newspaper and magazine circulation depended upon uh, what was written. Um, um, it could be uh, poems, it could be short stories. So um, this is the time when um, the people or the writers who took to short story writing were also making a lot of money and they were in turn um, the cause of the newspapers making money. So um, th this is no longer the time when uh, poets and um, story writers and novelists had to depend on the patronage of someone. Um, this is the time when, uh, especially in the United States, when a lot of money was going into publishing and uh, therefore writers could afford to um, take writing up 
as a means of livelihood. Now we have quite a few slides for um, this story today that is titled Through a Window. Um, and so I'm going to um, be going a little more um, speedier than uh, I normally do. Also, you are aware of the fact that we are nearing the end of this semester. And uh, with the end of this semester and this module, um, we, uh, we assume that your command of the short story uh, is greater than what it was when you started the semester. Also, this is your third semester. So um, you are that much faster in reading and in comprehension um, than you were in the, let's say, first and second semester. So um, let us see what A.G. Wells has for us. A.G. Wells, you know, is one of the pioneers um, in science fiction writing also. Um, although this story is not strictly speaking concerned with um, science fiction, we're going to come to that also. Um, but um, this will give you one aspect of H.G. Wells and the story that we'll be doing in the lecture after this uh, will um, make sense um, when you think back on what I said about H.G. Wells being a pioneer in science fiction writing. So um, let us launch into um, the text and see what H.G. Wells has for us today. Okay, so after his legs were set, they carried Bailey into the study and put him on a couch before the open window. There he lay. So um, straight away, Wells launches into an incident. Um, there's no chronology, um, chronology involved in the sense that um, you start with the birth and then you go on to important events and then you end with death. So straight off, he says that um, once the, the legs had been uh, cast in plaster, uh, Bailey, who is the protagonist of the story or the central character of the story, uh, was brought into the study and that is where he was uh, placed. So there he lay alive, even a feverish man down to his loins. So um, and from the top to the hips he was fine. But below that, he was a double-barreled mummy swathed in white wrappings. So below the hips, because his legs were in a plaster cast, he was all wrapped up. Um, so he was, um, Wells compares him to a mummy, a double-barreled uh, mummy because um, the two legs were separate. He tried to read even tried to write a little, but most of the time he looked out of the window. Now it's a very strategic position in which he's put. He has this window and um, he is in a lying position because he cannot move. You know when your um, legs have been put in a plaster cast, you just cannot move. And I want you to remember that um, a plaster cast in the 19th century was very much heavier than what you have in the 21st century. Modern medicine um, has come up with lightweight fiberglass uh, casts so that it's no longer um, the material that was used, let's say, in the 19th century. Now, if you have one leg in a plaster cast, you can still move around because it's not as heavy. But what you had in the 19th century were plaster casts that meant that you were placed where um, you wanted to be and then you couldn't move. Even if you wanted to, you just could not move. That is how heavy the plaster cast was. So he, had thought, he, he tried to read, he tried to write, but most of the time he was looking out of the window because it was a very interesting um, view that he saw there. And he never tired of looking out of the window because the scene was always changing. 
And um, this is where Wells tells us uh, what the different scenes were like. He had thought the window cheerful to begin with, but now he thanked God for it many times a day. So when um, the house was made and um, he saw this uh, window in the study, he had thought that it was a very nice window, but he had never appreciated the significance of this window as he did when he was brought home and um, laid out in uh, beside this window. Within the room was dim and gray and in the reflected light the wear of the sh furniture showed plainly. His medicine and drink stood on the little table with such litter as the bare branches of a bunch of grapes or the ashes of a cigar upon a green plate or a day-old evening paper. So um, Wells describes the interior of the room first because that is not going to take much time. It's not going to take much space. So he describes that just to sort of get it over and done with, get it out of the way. And then he goes on with uh, what Bailey can see outside the window. And you'll see how interesting those things are for him. So the room is dim, it's gray, but the window presents a very um, cheerful scene because there's a lot of light there. So the view outside was flooded with light and across the corner of it came the head of the acacia and at the foot the top of the balcony railing of hammered iron. So you know it's a very picturesque um, scene that Wells is describing here. He describes the window as if it's um, almost as if it's a television screen on which the scene keeps on changing. Um, it's not the kind of window where you have fixed um, fixed objects that you see and you'll, you, you'll see the reason uh, why in a, in, a, in a moment or so. So he describes the, the, picture, the, the picture window and he says that um, the corner of it you saw the head of the acacia that is um, the tree and at the foot you had the balcony railing. So um, th that gives you the idea that um, Bailey is on a slightly raised level. You see how Wells manages to convey that um, through the words and the phrases that he uses. In the foreground was the weltering silver of the river, never quiet and yet never tiresome. So you could see the river and um, this house is, uh, is, is by, the, by the river and that is why it's, um, it's a, it presents such an interesting view. Beyond was the reedy bank, a broad stretch of meadowland, and then a dark line of trees ending in a group of poplars at the distant bend of the river, and upstanding behind them a square church tower. You see how many things um, he's bringing together in that one window. It's not just a few objects, it's not just a few trees. You have a whole vista uh, spread out before you. So um, Bailey um, lying beside the window can uh, look out to the river. It can look out to beyond the river. You see how important this um, this window is, it gives such a wonderful view, not just of what is immediately outside the window, but it has a view that spreads out a couple of miles. So you have, um, you have trees, you have meadows, um, you have um, the, the, the river bank, and you even have a church tower. What more can you get into a window? 
and up and down the river all day long things were passing so wonderful view Bailey had and it's no surprise that he spends all his time looking out the window because something is always happening on the river now a string of barges drifting down to London piled with lime or barrels of beer then a steam launch disengaging heavy masses of black smoke and disturbing the whole width of the river with long rolling waves then an impetuous electric launch and then a boatload of pleasure seekers a solitary scholar or a four from some rowing club perhaps the river was quietest of a morning or late at night one moonlight night some people drifted down singing and with the zither playing it sounded very pleasantly across the water so there's so much that is happening on the river the whole day it's a it's a quiet uh, time in the early morning and then um, late night um, but when the sun is up you see a lot of activity you see uh, boats going up and down you see barges now um, you need to remember that um, the river in question is most probably the Thames now the Thames um, one of the characteristics of the Thames is that it's not very deep so that uh, a lot of the traffic on the river is these flat bottomed barges which carry goods from one place to another so um, he sees these barges going up and down and they're carrying as he says lime or barrels of beer that's some of the things that um, were being traded and then you had the steam launches, the, um, the, the boats that moved faster but were smaller. The barges were huge because they were used to carry um, food stuff and other things. So they had flat bottoms so that um, you could um, store a lot of things. And... Um, that's not the only thing that's traveling on the Thames. You have these steam launches um, and you have um, uh, you, have, you have rowing clubs uh, spread across um, the Thames side. So sometimes you'd, all, you'd, you'd just see four individuals uh, who are in a boat and you know that they're coming from some rowing club um, because um, the, um, the, um, th those who uh, were uh, members of the rowing club, they had groups of four um, or teams of four uh, who would row together. And he says, you know, some nights you could hear music being played. Um, some pleasure seekers would uh, hire a boat and um, they would have a party on it. And it was all very interesting because he got to hear music. He got to see different kinds of people. He got to actually see life on the River Thames. In a few days, Bailey began to recognize some of the craft. Now, because he was there, lying there, and he was looking um, out the window all the time, in a few days, he saw a definite pattern in the traffic on um, the river. The launch Luzon from Fitzy Gibbons, two miles up, would go fretting by, sometimes three or four times a day, conspicuous with its coloring of Indian red and yellow and its two oriental attendants. And one day, to Bailey's vast amusement, the houseboat Purple Emperor came to a stop outside and breakfasted in the most shameless domesticity. So, there, you know, there's a lot of life on the river. And um, the people who are traveling on the river do not know that they are being watched because, uh, one, 
uh, Bailey is lying down and two the room is dim so those who are outside in the sunlight cannot see inside but Bailey has a wonderful view outside he can look at people without people looking at him so a wonderful position um, that he occupies and um, Wells describes the different scenes that are taking place then one afternoon the captain of a slow moving barge began a quarrel with his wife as they came into sight from the left and by the time the barge reached um, the right of uh, the window the captain and the wife had actually started uh, hitting each other as he says personal violence he calls it uh, so a lot of interesting scenes uh, he can see now he regards this uh, as entertainment entertainment um, that is solely for his pleasure remember nobody else can see all this he can see it because he has the time because he has nothing else that he can do he can only lie in that uh, bed or that um, sofa and look out um, the window and then um, he he is very interested in what is happening because he sees a pattern he sees some barges and some boats and launches that um, travel um, on the Thames uh, in a regular pattern and his housekeeper Mrs. Green coming in at rare intervals with his meals would catch him clapping his hands or softly crying encore so anything that he liked he would say encore but obviously um, the people about whom he's talking they do not hear him they cannot see him and so there are no encores being played I should never have thought I could take such an interest in things that did not concern me now the thing is when you are um, in the peculiar position that Bailey is now you see things that you have never noticed now he's had this house by the river for years but it is only when he's forced to um, lie down in a particular place and in a particular position that he starts noticing all these interesting phenomena outside his house I thought this idle capacity was distinctive of little children and old maids but it's just circumstances I simply can't work and things have to drift it's no good to fret and struggle and so I lie here and I'm as amused as a baby with a rattle at this river and its affairs so um, he's, he's discussing it with his friend and he says you know I never thought that um, people could be so interesting but as I lie here as I'm forced to lie here I look outside and I see things that are really interesting that are happening now um, the reason why he uh, finds it interesting is because he can't do anything else there, there's nothing else that he can do he can't get up and walk around um, he can read and write but what he finds is that looking out at people at things at the river is far more interesting than reading and writing could ever be and therefore he makes his comparison with the baby with the rattle just as the the way that the baby um, discovers this rattle and starts shaking it um, and and is amused by it in the same way Bailey lying here um, beside the study window finds a lot to interest him in the world outside sometimes of course it gets a bit dull but not often I would give anything Wilderspin for a swamp once head swimming and a steam launch to the rescue and a chap or so hauled out with a boat hook and then he says there goes Fitzy Gibbons 
launch. They have a new boat hook, I see, and the little blackie is still in the dumps. Now, um, you know, he, he thinks that um, it would be very interesting if uh, once in a while um, somebody, let's say, uh, fell into the river and had to be saved uh, um, and taken out perhaps with a boat hook. And just as he is discussing this with Wilderspin, he sees the, the Fitzy Gibbons launch passing by. And he says, there's that Fitzy Gibbons launch. This is the one I was telling you about. Uh, but, you know, um, they have a new boat hook. Now, you see, the details that he's noticing now, he never thought he could or would notice. He even sees that they have a new boat hook. He also sees that um, the black um, man who, um, who, who serves on this launch is still very angry or very upset. So that means that um, Bailey has been noticing not just... Um, the people passing by, but their expressions and um, their, their moods, the, the changes in their temperament. So he is noting everything um, that, that is happening. I don't think he's very well. So he makes a comment about this, this black man on um, the Fitzy Gibbons um, launch and he says, I don't think he's feeling well, you know. He looks still down in the dumps. He's been like that for two or three days, so that gives you an idea of how um, keen um, his, his observation is. And he's squatting sulky fashion and meditating over the churning of the water. So he's just looking down into the river and he doesn't take an interest in anything else that is happening around him. Unwholesome for him to be always staring at the frothy water running away from the stern. So he tries to think of what is going through the mind of this uh, black man uh, who, um, who, who serves on um, Fitzy Gibbons' launch. They watch the little steamer fuss across the patch of sunlit river, suffer momentary occultation from the acacia. So when it passes by the tree, the tree hides the launch and then of course it glides out of sight behind the dark window frame. So this is the patch of life that uh, Bailey sees. And he also says, I'm getting a wonderful eye for details. I spotted that new boat hook at once. You know, another person would not notice it. The other niggard is a funny little chap. He never used to swagger with the old boat hook like that. So this um, black servant who is serving on um, the Fitzgibbons' um, launch is playing with the boat hook. Now that's a very dangerous thing to do. But um, he says that that's what he's doing and there's, there seems to be nobody around who can actually um, stop him. Now he calls this uh, person uh, black, but Wilderspin says, aren't they Malays? And he says, well, I don't know. I thought anyone who was serving on a ship was called a Lasker. And then he, of course, he begins to tell Wilderspin what he knows about the private affairs of the houseboat. Now he's very interested because he sees this houseboat or um, this boat on which people live. Um, you'd find a whole family living there, for example. So he says that the, the strange thing about this um, family in the houseboat is that they come from all over. They come from Oxford and Windsor, from Asia and Africa. So they're not just from one place or one continent. They come from all over the world. And therefore, they have their own interests and um, their, their own idea of, um, of uh, enjoyment. One man floated out of the infinite the day before yesterday, 
caught one perfect crab opposite, lost and recovered a skull and passed on again. Probably he will never come into my life again. So that's, that's the um, extent of the detail into which um, Bailey is going. So, so far as I am concerned, he has lived and had his little troubles, um, perhaps 30 or 40 years on this earth, merely to make an ass of himself for three minutes in front of my window. So from Bailey's point of view, this man um, has led a life and uh, that whole life has been for those three minutes in which he keeps Bailey entertained. So um, according to Bailey, um, that, that portion of time is the climax of, uh, of that man's um, life. A day or two after this, Bailey had a brilliant morning in, indeed, towards the end of the affair, it became almost as exciting as any windowsill very well could be. We will, however, begin at the beginning. And now he tells us what he's actually been planning to discuss. Bailey was all alone in the house, for his housekeeper had gone into the town three miles away to pay bills, and the servant had her holiday. So there was nobody around. Now this is rare because um, Bailey is an invalid. He cannot um, move on his own. And therefore, somebody is always um, there with him. So the morning became dull. Um, it, it started off as something very dull. And then action picked up around 10 in the morning. So let's see what the action was. It began with something white fluttering in the remote distance where the three poplars mark the river bend pocket handkerchief so there's this flutter of white far away and Bailey thinks it's a pocket handkerchief and then he says no it's a flag it's bigger than a handkerchief because if I can see it at this distance it cannot be a handkerchief and then he says perhaps it's a flag and then um, he notices that this white sort of jumps about and he says man and white running fast and this way, that's luck, but his whites are precious loose. So this is a man in a white dress, and um, he says that uh, what he had first thought to be a handkerchief turns out to be a man dressed in white clothes, and he is running towards Bailey. Now, between him and Bailey, there is um, still um, the river, but you see the general direction in which he's headed. And then something strange happened. There was a minute pink gleam among the dark trees in the distance and a little puff of pale gray that began to drift and vanish eastward. The man in white jumped and continued running. Pleasantly, the report of the shot arrived. Now, um, what Wells is talking about here is the fact that um, your um, the, the eye sees faster than the ear hears. So he sees something happening and he can't explain it because there's this puff of um, sort of smoke and the man jumps and then he realizes that the man has been shot so he, um, he, he becomes even more interested in what is happening the man is still far away what the devil looks as if someone is shooting at him so when he hears the report of the shot he is surprised because um, you know this is something that he doesn't expect here he sits up stiffly and he stares the white figure was coming along the pathway through the corn 
It's one of those niggers from Fitzgibbons. Or may I be hanged? I wonder why he keeps sawing with his arm. So um, he talks about this, um, th this plantation owned by Fitzgibbons and he says, it looks to me like one of his black servants um, running this way, but why is he making those motions? Then three other figures became indistinctly visible against the dark background of the trees. So first he sees this one man in white clothes and then he sees three other men who become visible. Abruptly, on the opposite bank, a man walked into the picture. So you see this is happening um, on the other side of the river. This side of the river, a man walks into the picture. He's black bearded, dressed in flannels, has a red belt and a vast gray felt hat. So a wealth of detail goes into H.G. Wells's description of this man. He walked leaning very much forward and with his head swinging before him. Behind him one could see the grass swept by the towing rope of the boat he was dragging. So there's this man running on the opposite side of the bank and this side of the river this man is walking dragging um, a boat and at the same time he's looking at the figure in white on the other bank suddenly he stops and then you see that um, he begins to pull the tow rope hand over hand over the water could be heard the voices of the people in the still invisible boat so he is pulling um, the boat and you can hear voices now but you can't actually um, see the boat that he's uh, that he's tugging and somebody calls out what are you after hang shot the individual with the red belt the one who's pulling at um, the boat he shouts something but it's difficult to understand him and he keeps on um, lagging in the rope and at the same time that he um, looks over his shoulder at the advancing white figure. So this man in white is headed towards him. He came down the bank and the rope bent a lane uh, among the reeds and lashed the water between his pulls. So um, a very strange scene. You see the man running on the other side of um, the uh, on the other side of the river. You see this man who is pulling a boat, and he's looking at this white um, figure approaching. The, just as uh, then, just the bows of the boat came into view, with the towing mast and a tall, fair-haired man standing up and trying to see over the bank. So this man comes um, into view and he's trying to see what is happening across um, the river. The boat bumped among the reeds and the tall fair-haired man disappeared suddenly having apparently fallen back into the invisible part of the boat. There was a curse and some indistinct laughter so no harm done but um, he sort of falls down and um, then the boat passes out of Bailey's side but he can still hear the people in um, the houseboat and um, they, they, they're busy telling each other what they should do. The running figure was drawing near the bank Bailey could now see clearly that it was one of Fitzgibbon's um, orientals and began to realize what the sinuous thing the man carried in his hand might be. So there's something that the man in white is carrying and, um, and, and the men across uh, the river want to know what it is that he's carrying. Three other men followed one another through the corn and the foremost carried what was probably the gun. So there are these um, three people uh, coming um, after this man in the white clothes. They were perhaps 200 yards or more behind 
the Malay and Bailey says it's a man hunt by all that's holy now by this time man hunts uh, were banned but they were still um, being practiced by many different um, agencies uh, and uh, Bailey thinks that you don't have any man hunts anymore but he sees one taking place and he cannot do anything the servant is away because she has the day off Mrs. Green the housekeeper the only person who is there with him all the time she has uh, gone to town and um, it's going to take her a long while to get back okay so it looks like this man is being hunted the Malay stops for a moment surveys the bank to the right leaves the path breaks through the corn and vanishes the three pursuers follow suit the men who are hunting him they follow him and their heads and arms are visible above the corn and then they also disappear remember we are looking at everything happening through the window and we can only see uh, what Wells wants us to see we can we can imagine what is happening outside the frame of the window but we what we can actually see is whatever comes in view of the window and this is very very frustrating for Bailey because he has seen this part of the scene um, he hasn't seen what happened before this he is and he can't see what's happening now so he says you know just as things were getting interesting I have lost those people and there's nothing I can do about it and then you heard a woman's shriek shouts a howl a dull whack upon the balcony outside that made Bailey jump and then the report of a gun and Bailey say Bailey you know is frustrated because he can't get up and try to see what is happening um, he can only lie there and suffer and try to imagine what's happening in the world outside but more was yet to happen in his picture in fact a great deal more the Malay appeared again running now along the bank upstream his stride had more swing and less pace in it than before he was threatening someone ahead with the ugly crease he carried so he's carrying um, uh, a knife a Malay knife uh, a weapon and um, he seems to be threatening someone um, with this crease or with this knife then came the tall fair man brandishing a boat hook and after him three other men in boating costume running clumsily with oars so these are the people from um, the rowing club the man with the gray um, hat and red belt was not with them after an interval the three men with the gun reappeared still in the corn but now near the river bank so you see he can see the action but only what is taking place inside that uh, picture window so the opposite bank was left blank and desolate again so um, very very frustrating for Bailey because he can't see what is happening outside uh, that uh, picture window and he starts swearing well says the sick room was, disgu uh, was disgraced by more profanity I would give my life to see the end of this so Bailey is so involved in what is happening that um, he wants to know what's happening now uh, what happened a moment ago is over and done with but what is happening now he sits up and he grumbles and he was still grumbling when he when his eye caught something black and round among the waves I said hello he looks and he sees two triangular black bodies frothing every now and then about a yard in front of this so he sees that this uh, Malay is swimming in the water he's still 
um, surprised at what is happening and um, he, he doesn't know what exactly is happening but now he sees something happening inside the river and he realizes that the Malay is swimming in the river. Uh, he, the, the Malay, he looks around, sees the gun and he goes, he dives. He dives and he goes under the water and then when he reappears, he is very close to Bailey's bank of the river. And when he comes out of the water, the man fires the gun. The Malay keeps steadily onward and Bailey can see him now because you see from the other bank he has traveled and he has come to Bailey's side of the river. So Bailey can see him more clearly now and then you know uh, again he's hidden by the balcony. And um, by this time Bailey is totally frustrated and he says, you know, what, how am I going to find out uh, what has happened to this man uh, but he need not have um, he need not have been uh, very impatient because uh, very soon things very close to him start to change he looks out at the river everything appears calm he looks at the further bank nothing is happening etc etc and Bailey says you know there has to be something more than this. So five minutes passed, ten minutes, then a tug with two barges went upstream. The attitudes of the men upon these were the attitudes of those who see nothing remarkable in earth, water or sky. So everything appears to be routine and calm again. And uh, Bailey is totally frustrated because he doesn't know what has happened to uh, the man who was being hunted and what is the progress um, in the manhunt. But um, he need not have waited for long because the hunt comes very close to Bailey. He hears a step on the staircase behind him and looks in, looking around sees the door open. Mrs. Green comes in and sits down panting. You know she's been to town and she's tired so she just comes in and she sits down. She still has her bonnet on and um, so she, she just comes and she sits beside him. And um, then she leaves and um, Bailey is back to thinking of what has happened to the manhunt. And he's, uh, he, he gives advice to Mrs. Green and um, then Mrs. Green comes out with her explanation and that is that one of those black creatures and you see how racist uh, Mrs. Green has been shown to be because she refers to this Malay as a creature not as a human being and she says that one of those creatures, one of those black creatures at Fitzgibbons had gone mad and he was running around with a knife. He had killed a groom, stabbed the under butler and almost cut the arm of a boating gentleman. So now you remember those three men uh, with oars um, running along with um, these men who are hunting the Malay. And Bailey says, oh, so he's running around with a crease. Now I know what is happening. And um, he had, and, and this man had been hiding in the woods when Mrs. Bailey was uh, coming back home. So um, Bailey, you know, to, to get his bit of fun says, and did he come after you? And Mrs. Green says, no, that was the horrible part of it. You know, she had not known that he was there. If, um, if, if she had, she would have done something about it. So um, she, she can only imagine what things were like because she didn't actually see him. She, she heard about him when she had come back. She heard about it from people. So um, Bailey, you know, says, um, I'm feeling hungry. Could you get me something to eat? And Mrs. 
uh, Mrs. Mrs. Green um, at once says, you know, don't let me go out of this room. He might catch me and he might kill me. I just want to stay here with you. Now Bailey is, <laughs> um, is getting hungry and uh, he wants his lunch, but um, Mrs. Green is not willing to, to move from there. And all of a sudden, she looks at the window and what does she see? For the space of half a second, things seemed just as they were. There was the tree, the balcony, the shining river, the distant church tower. Then Bailey noticed that the acacia was displaced about a foot to the right and that it was quivering and the leaves were rustling. So you see how Wells builds up that atmosphere. Nothing is happening. There's the tree, there's the river, there's the church tower. And then he notices something happening to the acacia tree. The tree was shaken and you could hear the sound of someone panting heavily. In another moment, a brown hand had appeared and clutched the balcony railings. So this Malay had come to Bailey's house. He had traveled all that distance and he had come to Bailey's house. In another second, the face of the Malay was peering through the window at the man on the couch, and that is Bailey. And he had an unpleasant grin because he was holding the crease or the knife between his teeth. So his teeth were stretched like this because he's holding that knife. Remember, he's been swimming. So, um, um, when he uh, his when he's swimming he has the crease between his teeth and then when he's climbing up the house to the balcony railing um, he has to hold his uh, his crease or his um, his knife in his teeth so uh, holding that knife there his his face gets a kind of a grin and um, and this is actually very scary for Green, for Mrs. Green and for, uh, for Bailey. He holds on to um, this Malay, he holds on to the balcony railing, um, raises himself and that is when Mrs. Green sees him and she screams. Bailey thought swiftly and clutched a medicine bottle in either hand. So what he does is he doesn't have anything else, he doesn't have a weapon. The only thing he can see is that medicine bottle. See, he, so he uh, grabs hold of the medicine bottle and um, he throws it at the Malay. Of course, nothing happens. The, the bottle uh, hits the acacia tree. Uh, it breaks and um, he and the Malay keeps coming. He, he comes on to the balcony. Uh, Mr. Bailey grabs hold of the second medicine bottle and um, sees the man come one leg at a time over the balcony. It was Bailey's impression that the Malay took about an hour to get his second leg over the rail, but that is just a matter of um, perspective, uh, a matter of how time seems to drag when you don't like what is happening and how it just flies by when you're doing something interesting and something enjoyable. So according to Bailey, it took the Malay about an hour to get his second leg over the balcony railing, but it must have been, you know, a, a minute, half a minute, something like that. So, um, Bailey still doesn't realize what is happening and what it could possibly mean for him. Suddenly, the Malay looks back over his shoulder and there is the crack of a rifle. He flings up his arms and he comes down on the couch, down on Bailey. Mrs. Green shrieks 
and and she screams and she screams now actually the Malay has fallen over Bailey and Bailey is sort of strapped you know he his his legs are in plaster casts he can't move and he can just look at this this brown body that is flung across him across his body and it's um, and because um, he has been uh, he, he's been fired at his shoulder blade is sort of driven in and he is writhing in in his death throes that's Bailey's body he's across Bailey's body and Mrs. Green starts screaming although um, no personal uh, harm has come to her so Bailey you know he just looks at this knife he looks at this body that is sprawled across him and then he looks at Mrs. Green uh, who's supposed to be taking care of him and she, she is just screaming and screaming and screaming and then the body gives one last convulsive effort the Malay grips the crease tries to raise himself with his left hand and collapses he raises his head stares for a moment at Mrs. Green and twists, twists his face round to look at Bailey with a gasping groan the dying man succeeded in clutching the bedclothes with his disabled hand see the amount of strength that Wells gives to this Malay he's dying and yet he has um, strength to grasp at um, the bedclothes and um, he, he makes a, a violent effort um, and then it, it's like you know he's going to um, to 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 throw the knife at Mrs. Green and that is when something snaps in Bailey's mind he uh, he he ha remember he has that second bottle of medicine in his hand he raises his hand and he um, throws that medicine bottle at the Malay's face and that of course finishes the Malay off that medicine if, if he had not used it there's no knowing what this Malay this servant was gone mad would have done um, and of course then Fitzgibbon and the rescue party come in people who've been hunting him down they come in and Bailey um, Bailey's legs are hurting him because remember that Malay is sprawled across his legs so uh, he says you know easy with those legs be very careful I'm hurting uh, and if you move him too fast you're going to hurt me um, and young Fitzgibbon says I didn't mean to kill him you know he had he had tried to injure the Malay in such a way that um, they could um, arrest him and they could take him back but um, the last uh, rifle shot um, really really hit the target so um, that's how Wells ends this story um, before I leave off let me quickly run through the story I'm, I'm sure you would have found it interesting also for me um, teaching it was interesting because whatever you are seeing you um, you see only one aspect of life and um, Wells in the story through the window tells us that um, whatever we see uh, we see only one angle what is happening from other angles is not visible to us and in this story he sort of builds up the atmosphere by describing Bailey who has 
become an invalid because um, both of his legs are encased in plaster and he's forced to lie on a couch um, beside um, a window and um, this this house because it is on the river side has this uh, this big picture window uh, which gives you a very good view of what is happening outside but throughout the description of um, of what is happening there throughout the description of the, the quarrel between the captain and his wife um, the the rowing boat the Fitzgibbon launch uh, the Malay um, servant who has um, who was running around with a knife uh, the manhunt, the pursuit, the, um, the, the the traveling of the Malay across the river, the boating party coming in, the um, um, the Malay finally um, jumping on to the balcony of um, uh, of Bailey's house, and then coming and falling on uh, on, on Bailey. All this shows us just one angle, and that is Bailey's angle. We don't know uh, why the man went mad, uh, what was going through his mind, uh, and why Fitzgibbons um, hunts him down, why he says, you know, I hadn't meant to kill him. Uh, Bailey says it's just as well because if Fitzgibbon had meant to kill the Malay you don't know what he might have done you know he fires twice at the man both times the man is hit the first time he's injured but the second time just finishes him off but then um, the situation in which uh, fit the, the young Fitzgibbon sees uh, the Malay is one where he has to act fast he uh, has already entered the house he has fallen across Bailey's body he could easily have injured either um, Bailey or uh, Mrs. Green even further so um, it, it's, it's been an interesting story so far and um, we'll have other stories um, by H.G. Um, Wells before we come to the end of this module uh, but uh, for today for this class um, thank you for being attentive and Allah Hafiz